for those words. Ms. Pat and I were talking earlier, it's an oldie but goodie, and it's something that never fades away. He will continue to be the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Amen. Amen. And we praise God <coughs> for that. Well, tomorrow is July the 4th, and we ought to be thankful, amen, amen, for the country he's given us to live in. And one of the things that we ought to do because of that is to do his word or carry out what he tells us to do. So we're going to talk about that today from James 1, 17 through 27. Have you ever heard the phrase, talk is cheap? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? You don't mean it, okay? You talk it, but you don't carry it out. It's something that is easy to say, but maybe maybe not uh, as easy to carry out. Uh, it's been in use, from what I can find, since the 1800s, exact origin, not really known. Um, all talk and no action uh, pretty much means the same thing. We say things, but we don't mean them. There's a lot of that that goes on today and even more of it will go on between now and November if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Jesus illustrated that in the parable of the two sons in Matthew 21. You remember that story? The, the father wa wanted the sons to go out and help him in the vineyard. So he asked the one son, will you go out and help me in the vineyard? His son said, sure dad, I'll be happy to but he didn't do it. Talk must have been cheap to him. But he asked his other son, son, will you go out and help me in the vineyard? And his son said, no, daddy, I got, I got too many things to do. But I guess his conscience got him and the Holy Spirit might have touched him and he went and helped his daddy. Uh, also, those whom Jesus asked to follow him, you remember, uh, they said, yes, but first let me go and bury the dead. First, let me go and say goodbye. Uh, talk was cheap. What they were saying was, I want to delay as long as I can before I, before I do that. And Peter said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go, even to death. But we know that he denied Jesus three times. The scribes and the Pharisees knew what was right by the word of God, but they didn't do it, and they ended up having Jesus crucified. The parable of the Good Samaritan. The religious leaders uh, the Bible says it walked by on the other side, but the Good Samaritan uh, didn't seem to care whether there was danger or what the situation was or whatever it was that caused this problem. He was willing uh, to do that uh, because his talk, his talk was not cheap. Uh, and then in today's verses, Jesus' command, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Uh, in other words, it's, it's easy to, to maybe even uh, memorize scripture. It's easy to come and talk about what we should be doing. It's good to come and look at God's word, memorize God's word, and talk about God's word, and talk about how we believe God's word and we trust God's word, but we go out and do just the opposite. And that's what I want us to talk about for a few minutes uh, today, uh, being doers of the word and not hearers only. So in James 1, starting in verse 27, we find these words. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights or the Creator, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, he says, let every man be swift to hear, and slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And then here it is. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes, he carefully looks at it, at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man, what kind of person he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless or in vain. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Uh, that, I say, would be measured by compassion, uh, God-like agape love. Amen? Amen? So I want us to examine these uh, verses today and think about the fact that many times we, we talk about doing things. Many times these things come into our minds and our hearts, especially when we get together and, and look at God's Word and we think about God's Word and the Holy Spirit convicts us of some situation in life that maybe we need to do, we need to carry out, maybe we need to study more, maybe we need to be more involved in a, in a ministry or whatever. And it seems like a lot of times the moment we go out of these assemblies, those things begin to fade away from our minds and we end up not doing it. So the first thing I think we have to do in order to be doers of the word is we have to break free from the past. Uh, the past is something that can hold you back, amen? And I've dealt with so many people in my time of ministry and I have observed it in my own life and observed it with people around me with the fact that they allowed the past, the things that happened to them in the past, the things maybe they did in the past, to hold them back from going forward and doing the things in the future. Uh, I just heard just uh, this morning or yesterday in a text, I, I said I heard it, I didn't hear it. I saw it in a text. Someone told me this, that a friend of theirs said, if I come to church, the roof will fall in. What are they saying? My past. My past is bad. And if I come, I don't know if I can survive because I don't know if I'm good enough to be there. But our verse has said this in James 1.21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That, that phrase is used of taking off filthy, dirty clothes so that you can put on clean ones. Uh, there's several things we always have, to, we should always remember about our past. You can't change it. Amen? Your past is your past. You can't change it. Uh, it doesn't matter how hard you try, the past is there and it's the past. There's a lot of things I would like to change from my past. I wish I had started being more diligent about God's work when I was a teenager and in my 20s rather than waiting until I was pretty much in my 30s before I did it. Those are times I wish that I could change, but I can't. They're gone. They're, they're in history, we might say. Also, in some ways, we can't make up for the past. You know, a lot of times we say, I'm gonna do these things to make up for the past. Well, you do things for the present and for the future, but yes, you can be better than you were in the past, but in some ways you're not really making up from the past. We should never dwell on the past because the past, uh, except dwelling on the past to know how it can help us for the present and the future. Uh, we should always understand that God is there to forgive us from any past experiences in our life that we might have had. And I have times that I, I are brought up to me, I'm sure by the Holy Spirit from time to time, to remind me of the way I was in the past and I wasn't faithful to God like I should have been in the past to let me know how thankful I am for forgiveness, that God has forgiven me that I can now move forward. We have to learn from the past uh, and use it for the future and then move on uh, ahead. Uh, and, and you may, I have run into people uh, from the past uh, that uh, you can tell by the questions that they have when they're talking to you. They're trying to figure in their minds now, has he really changed? I want to know, has he really changed or is he just putting up some kind of front for the way he used to be. Here's something we should never forget. All of us have a past. Amen? Yeah. Now, uh, some of our pasts 
are a little bit worse than others. Uh, I, can, I can recall at least one person right now, not that he's the only person, but I was talking to him about things and he couldn't understand the way people in their late teens, their early 20s were because he hadn't been that way. But I told him, you're, you're the exception. <laughs> You've grown up different than I did. You've grown up different than most people because most people have at least some of their early life when they kind of, I guess, sow their wild oats, you might say. There's a whole lot of things I did besides sowing wild oats, but, but, but I tried to explain to him, but it's hard to explain to him because he had never been involved in any of the things that most young kids are involved in. Uh, but all of us have a past, and, and most, uh, most all of our pasts are different. We could get together and we could talk about things, and, and sometimes I, I remind people, they'll tell me, D did you see what those kids did? I said, yeah, terrible, wasn't it? Yeah, it's terrible. I said, I'm, I'm sure glad we weren't that way when we were young. And they pause a minute and they say, we were, weren't we? I said, yeah, I was. I, I, you can speak for yourself, but I was. I was, I was a little rambunctious. I, I, I was doing things. People say it's just boys, you know, but, but all boys don't always act that way. So most of us, uh, most of our pasts are different. We must all get rid of any past that hinders us from moving forward. And that involves forgiveness. And it's easy to go to God and ask him to forgive us. But then we have to forgive ourselves also. We have to know that that is behind us that God has forgiven us and he has forgotten it. That's something that we can't do. Uh, so the past can be there and all of us have a past. Some may be worse than others, but all of us have a past. But that naturally leads us to a second truth. Truth, give away, give way to the true gospel. You can't just empty yourself of old habits. You have to fill your life with good ones. If you don't, the bad habits are going to sneak in. Uh, our verses said this in James 1 21, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Uh, receive the word of God with meekness. Meekness and gentleness, gentleness in the Bible uh, uh, speaks similar things of humility, inward expressions uh, towards God, uh, gentleness and power. And, and it, it's used sometimes of a, of a, a horse, a, an animal that may be 2,000 pounds and he's got strength, but you use him under control. So what we have to do is use the strength that God gives us, but use it under control. In other words, we have to, in, I, I think most every day, we have to understand who God is and who we are. And we understand that we have the power of God available to us, but on our own, we're going to fail. On our own, we're, we're really uh, hopeless. On our own, we're, we're of no power at all, no strength at all. But with the power of God through the Holy Spirit, we have that power that we need to help us to move through life and do the things that we need to do. Paul told those at Ephesus to be filled with the Spirit, which means, uh, you know, we have the Spirit of God within us the moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But we don't always use the power that's there. And, and this last Sunday, or maybe Sunday was a week ago, uh, I used an illustration in Bible study. We came in and we, we could have just left the light switches down, which Brother Leon always wanted them down when they were all up when they were on. And he didn't want some down and some up. Because when they were, he'd go back in the room back in and get them straight. Right, Emily? Always. They got to be right. I don't blame him. Uh, uh, but we could have left the lights off and not used the power that we had, but we wouldn't have been able to see as good. 
but we turned them on. And that's what this means in, Ephes in, in, in Ephesians, that we should be filled with the Spirit of it. We have the Holy Spirit within us if we have Jesus. The Bible says so. If we have the Spirit, we have Him. Uh, we, we, we belong to Him. If we don't have the Spirit, we don't belong to Him. We have that, but we don't always use the Spirit. We ought to be filled with the Spirit every day. It's a continual thing that we ought to do. Uh, and I, I always think about this, and I just uh, told someone this a uh, day or two ago. I was trying to remember who it was. Uh, what goes in determines what comes out. I know who it was. I was buying something at, at uh, Publix, some uh, salmon for us to have, and the man walked up, and, and I told him I wanted the bourbon, whatever it is, salmon. He said, can you Baptist uh, drink bourbon? I said, no, sir, but we can eat it. <laughs> It'll be cooked out before then. And I said, uh, he said something about putting what you put in and all, and I said, you know, it, it, what comes out is determined a large way by what you put in. If you put junk in, junk's going to come out. If you continually dwell on junk, you're going to junk's going to come out. If you dwell on the Word of God, the Word of God's going to come out. Uh, if you don't continually fill yourself with God's Word, something else will fill you up. I know that from my own life, and I hope and pray that you know that also. The old saying was, an, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. One translation of Proverbs 16, 27 is this. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, and idle lips are his mouthpiece. Uh, I can say amen to that. The bottom line, fill your mind and your time with the implanted word of God, or else something else is going to slip in, and maybe even eventually take over. That brings us to our last truth, the third thing. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why do we come to church? Why do we come to church? Praise God. Praise God. Why else? Fellowship. Worship. Sing praises to God. Fellowship. Fellowship with other believers. To get fed. To get fed. Commanded. Hot dogs and hamburgers? No, sir. Oh, the word. This word. Yes. There you go. <laughs> And it's the command of God. But we should never forget, and we said part of this, we come to be taught, we come to learn, we come to experience what we need to be doing out there. Amen? Amen. I had a lady, and I've mentioned this to you before, uh, but she used to sit right back on the back, on the left-hand side. And she used to call me sometime and tell me what she was going to do that weekend because she wasn't going to be in church. And I always told her. She kind of told me like, uh, I, I'm confessing to you, you know. <laughs> and I always tell her, listen, we come to church to do a lot of things. We mentioned them. But we come to learn. And we, we come to, to learn how to do ministry. But if we don't go out there and do ministry, then why should we come and learn how to do it? And she would tell me, and I've told you all this before, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be taking an old lady over to Savannah to see her friends this weekend, that her, some of her family. Uh, and I'm thinking, how old is this lady? Cause you're about 80 yourself. And you're talking about you're gonna take this old lady over there. Well, I knew some of them, some of them were younger than her, uh, but that's what her ministry was. She would do things for people. She did them for people in Macon that I, I know. She did them for people in this church. She did them for people in this community. She did it for her family and her friends. What she was doing was coming to church, and yes, she was worshiping. Yes, she was studying. Yes, she was learning. Yes, she was fellowshipping with other believers. But she was understanding that the love of God that he had given to her, she needed to show to other people. And so she was doing ministry. And if we're not going to do ministry, what good is it for us to 
come and learn about ministry. Our verses said this in James 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Uh, that is measured, I believe, by a compassionate, God-like, agape love. Amen? Yes. We're to treat people the way God has treated us, not the way they treat us. Uh, but we want to sometimes, don't we? Uh, Jesus saw the multitudes, the Bible says, and had compassion on them. Uh, I, I, I wonder if we are always that way. The hated Samaritan saw a man in need. And in spite of the risk, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave, and that's what we ought to do. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to be a servant to all. Uh, the ladies that went to the tomb to anoint Jesus had that compassionate heart. The lady that took a pound of uh, very expensive uh, oil anointed Jesus' feet with it. It was probably all she had. It was, she was trying to show her love. Christ washed his feet, washed the disciples of the feet, the feet of the disciples, and he showed his love, his compassion, and gave us, he told them, this is an example for what you're supposed to do. Servanthood, doing things for people. Uh, we could go on and on and on about uh, people in the Bible, and we could give illustrations, I'm sure, of people that we know that, that have done this for people over and over and over. So, true Christianity, according to what we were saying, involves godly love, a, a love that gives uh, unconditionally, a love that gives regardless of what we get back, uh, compassion for other people, uh, a compassion that uh, is shown to everybody and not just some that are gonna show that compassion back to us. Uh, doing what we say we learn when we come and we study God's word uh, uh, to do it. You know, I, I read a verse of scripture one time in a message and it was talking about going the extra mile and uh, turning the other cheek and so forth. And uh, a man asked me after the service, are you telling me I'm supposed to do those things? I said, I didn't say that. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, the Bible said it. Jesus said it. So if, you, if you're going to dispute with someone, you've got to dispute uh, with him. Knowing we get nothing in return, that's when we are doing what God would have for us to be. And that's when we're really church, uh, the people that we should be. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, we have to be servants. We have to have a servant's heart. We have to do ministry around us. Uh, pride gets in the way, does it not? We, it comes into our mind, I ought to not be having to do this. There's people that could do it. But that servant's heart goes and does it and doesn't worry about whose responsibility it is to do it. And that's showing the love of God. Doing the word, not just a hearer of it. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the blessings of life that you give us. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity of freedom that we have that we can celebrate tomorrow, but that we celebrate every day of our lives. We thank you that we have the freedom to come into this place and study your word, look at your word, and send your word out to those that are not able to be here. We thank you and praise you for all that you do for us, for this body of believers, for this place of comfort, freedom, and safety that we can come to. And we pray, Father, that you just be with us and uh, cause us to understand we, we're not just to learn what your word says, but we're to be doers of it for those around us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.